Greetings and welcome back from the new year. I hope everyone had a prosperous time off of work, spending time with family and friends, and everyone stay healthy. Welcome to Sports 101, the sports show that discusses sport beyond the X's and O's. We like to expand our conversation of sports to include the history, past, present, and in the making. We also look at the game from a people, places, and things perspective, always trying to identify cultural elements within sport. I am your host, Jamar Hart. Be sure to follow me at Coach underscore Hart 412. Make sure you get social with this show and all the other shows on Sports Zone Chicago, the Motown of Sports Talk Radio. Please follow Sports Zone Chicago at Sports Zone CHI on Twitter, Facebook at Sports Zone Chicago, and Instagram at Sports Zone Chicago. Remember, Sports Zone Chicago, the Motown of Sports Talk Radio is a sports talk app. You can watch and listen to my show as well as the litany of other shows on Sports Zone Chicago. Please keep up with breaking sports news. And if you miss a show, don't worry about it. You can go to the podcast or watch the video via our YouTube channel. So please subscribe to the YouTube channel Sports Zone Chicago. More importantly, we need everyone to download the Sports Zone Chicago app. The app can be found in the iTunes google play and amazon stores now let's get to this week's episode today's episode we're going to talk about, is entitled excuse me six feet and under we're going to examine the philippine basketball association and some cultural elements that was makes basketball phenomenon in the philippines when most people look at the philippines you don't think basketball you think of island country uh short people um, there's some stereotypes. Everyone yells when they talk, um, impoverished. Uh, but no one thinks this is a basketball hotbed. Um, recently, you with the exploits of Manny Pacquiao and boxing, um, he's gained some notoriety for the uh, island chain. But most people still don't think of it as a basketball hotbed. Um, in the Philippines, however, basketball is viewed as a religion. Um, basketball gear is kind of like a suit and tie. So you can work at church, school, anywhere. Um, there's a few pictures we like to examine before we get into our episode. Um, if you um, look at these pictures right here, you see the variety of scenes basketball is being played in. Um, you saw a rural scene. You saw a city scene. Uh, you see kids playing basketball without any shoes. Um, you see rims made out of wood. And in this last picture right here, is the highest form of basketball in the Philippines, which is the Philippine Basketball Association. Now, when you look at this picture, you can kind of see a lot of cultural elements involved. Um, after this show, hopefully, we'll be able to identify at least some of these. Um, but from looking at the picture, I can see people indigenous to the Philippines, um, from the Aeta tribe, most likely. Um, I can see someone that can be um, uh, African-American, and I also see um, European uh, Philippine citizens in there as well. Um, also looking at the stadium, this is one of their professional basketball stadiums, and we'll go into this a little later, but their professional league is uh, not like the NBA. We have teams set in certain cities. You have teams, they're all tied to a, a business. So that business takes them throughout the um, archipelago or the islands of the Philippines, and they play in national arenas. So it could be like, think of Sprint basketball playing, uh, you know, McDonald's in, you know, different cities throughout the United States. Uh, so that's an example of the different forms of basketball within the Philippines. But where did this love affair with basketball come from? Um, to answer that, we have to look at the history of the Philippines. And uh, to do that, I want to bring up this picture right here that kind of uh, invokes references uh, to this rich cultural heritage that the Philippines uh, um, has. Uh, so if you look at this picture right here, um, if you can see the Philippines is located in Southeast Asia, um, which is uh, pretty much south of uh, China um, in the Pacific Ocean. Um, and if you look at, if you know anything about Vietnam, Cambodia, um, there are more darker skinned uh, people than the Chinese. Uh, even going back to China, the uh, originators of China um, also uh, came from uh, East Africa. So there's a strong African heritage throughout this. Um, but getting back to the Philippines, when you look at Southeast Asia, 
Um, that is, uh, for those reasons I just stated, um, this whole area is known for its black population um, due to the um, Shang Li dynasty um, founding in, in China and different civilizations or uh, cultures of people coming from Central and East Africa um, to Southeast Asia. Uh, so when you look at the Philippines right here, um, a lot of people that visit there notice the uh, African heritage within the Philippines and uh, the rich culture that's there. Um, so that uh, kind of shows you right there um, why um, um, the history and the culture that comes behind that. So again, the Philippines is an archipelagic. Uh, that's our multiple islands that form a country. And this country is located obviously in Southeast Asia. Um, the Philippines is situated in the Western Pacific Ocean and consists of about 7,600 islands. All these islands are not inhabited. Um, again, uh, the Philippines sits in a ring of fire. Um, the ring of fire is known for its earthquakes and volcanoes. Um, so some of these islands um, are not safe. Um, they uh, have uh, volcanic e eruptions, um, uh, earth, uh, not earthquakes, uh, but uh, just the land is not stable uh, to produce uh, any crops or fertile um, due to where it's located uh, in a ring of fire. Um, so again, um, there's a lot of places in the Philippines that are still um, free and open that uh, you can kind of buy similar to the Bahamas. Um, the population of the Philippines currently is 105 million. And within that 105 million, you have multiple different ethnic groups and cultures. Um, these cultures come from different wars that were fought and colonization. Um, to get to that, um, we want to talk about the history of the Philippines. And we want to go back to 1493. Um, that's when the Catholic Church, uh, Pope uh, Rodrigo Borgia, issued the Papal Bull of Demarcation. Uh, so we're going to go over that again. I know that was discussed in several episodes, but again, this is a critical point in history and it overlaps so many different subjects. Um, so when we look at this picture right here, you'll see, um, okay, this is an um, indigenous uh, person uh, from uh, the Philippines. And um, as I previously stated, or um, a lot of the people in that region come from Central and East Africa. And by looking at the picture, um, if I didn't say we were talking about the Philippines, uh, you could kind of see um, where uh, this person or originates from. Well, anyway, in 1493, um, Spain and Portugal were two large Catholic uh, countries. Uh, Spain had just uh, came into uh, accepting its, uh, I guess, European heritage uh, through the uh, marriage of Isabel and uh, Ferdinand, and they kicked the Moors out of Southeast Spain and became a, a, a complete Catholic nation. Uh, so the Catholic nations want to fight over colonization, and particularly colonization of Africa and other places dominated by people of color. Uh, he split the world in half and gave half to Spain and half to uh, Portugal, um, and henceforth the Papal Bull of Demarcation. Um, and this happened in 1493. So in 1500, there was a Portuguese explorer uh, named Magellan. He took a fleet uh, for Spain. Remember, uh, since he, it was Portuguese, uh, he didn't have this uh, side of the country, but since he knew how to uh, navigate, at this time, a lot of people thought the world was flat, so they were scared to get into the ocean. Um, but he was a navigator, so he took a ship, uh, uh, even though he was Portuguese, he did it for Spain in 1500. And I kind of became a colonizationator, not only for Spain, but for other European countries. Um, in 1543, a Spanish explorer, Roy Lopez de Villalobos, uh, he named the Archipelago. Again, that's a group of islands, Las Islas Filipinas, in honor of Philip II. Uh, Philip II was the uh, king of Spain, um, obviously the second king. Uh, in 1565, um, the Philippines became part of the Spanish Empire and stayed that way for about 300 years. Um, so in this time, there was a lot of uh, colonization going on. Uh, so besides this original migration of the um, aid to people from Central and East Africa, there was a greater African presence brought through the Spanish uh, slave ships. You know, 
you you bring up something that jumps out to me and I and most people if you happen to know people that are uh, from the Philippines they often have Spanish last names mm -hmm. um, which will let you know obviously it's not indigenous which this comes from obviously Spain and Portugal having such a large influence hence similar things you see often when you see people from the African continent that don't have traditional African names it's about colonization so the, right. the, the, the kind of like the the thing you should pick up from this is oh your name is Gonzalez but you're Filipino because they were a Spanish colony. They were influenced and built by the Spaniards. So just want to point that out. If, if you know some Filipinos, they tend to have Spanish last names. Yep. yep. Thank you so much. And this is our super producer, Maya, uh, my sensei, through my podcast journey. Um, she is exactly right. There's another point that a lot of people don't realize. Uh, Lagos, Nigeria. Uh, Lagos is a Portuguese name. Um, Elamina Slave Castle in uh, Ghana. Uh, that is a Portuguese name. So a lot of the names derive from, you know, colonization. Um, now let's jump to 1898, um, the Spanish-American War. Uh, this is when Spain lost the uh, Philippines uh, uh, to the United States. At uh, this time, uh, Christian missionaries uh, begin to come in and the game of basketball was brought. Uh, usually the men uh, were uh, reluctant to come to church, uh, similar to today. So it'll be a lot of uh, women and children in there that uh, initially converted uh, from their uh, indigenous or uh, cultural religions. And they use uh, they use basketball as a tool uh, to break language barriers and just make people feel comfortable. Um, so the YMCA and the Catholic Church uh, actually brought basketball uh, to the Philippines. Um, there was a brief war with the United States and tensions and uh, Philippines or insurgency within uh, the Philippines. The United States, uh, you know, held control, but the Philippines became an independent nation in 1946 around the end of World War II. Um, so again, the next question people ask is, why are a majority of native Philippine uh, Filipinos short? And to answer this question, we're gonna go back to, um, a little bit of colonization, but actual to people migration. Um, so now we're going to talk about the Eta Negritos. Um, Eta is the cultural group or tribe that the people come from in uh, Central and uh, East Africa. And Negritos is a Spanish word for little black people. Um, that's what uh, the Spanish and Portuguese call the pygmies um, that uh, you find in, originally in Central and East Africa, but that migrated to different places in the Pacific and um, East Asia. So again, here are some pictures of the Aita people. Um, these people right here are born and raised in the Philippines. Um, they are from the Aita tribe or cultural group that directly came from uh, Central and uh, East Africa, um, also known as Pygmies. And they uh, are cousins or they derive from the Twa people. Um, so you can look at this picture right here and uh, just clearly look at it uh, again if it wasn't we weren't talking about the philippines i don't think anyone would know um if i say these people were filipino um you can look at the texture of these uh, young women's hair um their mannerisms the way they wear their hair uh similar to uh black women throughout the uh, uh african diaspora um this next picture right here is going to tell another tale as well Um, this picture right here um, is a cultural and religious symbol. So um, I talked about the Twa people. Um, the Twa um, or the pygmies of uh, East Africa um, that uh, went into not only Asia, but they went to Europe as well. Um, and you see the snakes that the person is holding. The snake was deified uh, in Africa. Um, the only time the snake became um, evil is the advent of uh, Christianity when the snake was made uh, to be associated uh, with the devil. Um, but the snake was a religious and spiritual and cultural symbol. And the Twa people used to wear it on their hats. Uh, so when the Twa people uh, migrated to Europe um, due to their cultural practices, um, they knew medicine, you know, they bathed, they did different things that people in Europe didn't do at the time. They were looked at magical. Um, so um, they lived in Europe and they were kind of uh, uh, looked at as healers and for information. All this happened and or stopped abruptly uh, 
when uh when you think of saint patrick's day when uh saint patrick kicked all the snakes aka the twa people um out of uh ireland so that's a, just a quick fun fact but um again uh the eights and the gritos are the original ha- inhabitants of the philippines um they're again they're a cultural and a tribal group that recognize that they come from africa um, just like other places um in the world that have multiple cultures and experience colonialism the darker people are shunned um, also known as a caste system uh, so they love it when you know people come to their villages um they often shout out hey brother uh when obama was president they would shout obama trying to signify that you know black people everywhere were united when they uh, came to their village so if you ever want to take a trip to the philippines don't just visit manila um uh go to um the negrito land and we'll kind of talk about that a little later so um how did they get to the philippines well um the eights and negritos they walked from eastern central africa around forty thousand years ago um remember the tectonic plate shifted um which caused you know floods um not a big flood that uh you know ended the world but there was just you know flooding so the, the some of these bridges aren't there anymore and that's how they ended up in southeast um, asia and uh again this was forty thousand years ago um again they're relatives to the twa people of east africa i just gave you the fun fact about saint patrick and um they escaped a lot of being integrated into regular culture of the philippines due to where they settled um based on uh topography of where they came from you know central and uh eastern africa they wanted to go into mountainous regions so they settled uh on the islands that had mountains so during spanish rule it was kind of hard to get there so again the island of luzon in the philippines is a to negrito lands so i would encourage everyone to go there and check out the culture check out the um the village and just see how the people react to you um it's definitely in one of my trips in the making so i want to tell other people about it as well too um during spanish colonization um they were able to fight off the spanish a lot better than other people on the island due to their iron making again iron making or smelting is something that's indigenous uh, to africa it was done thousands and thousands of years ago and they brought this technique to the philippines um they also brought the bow and arrow um, they were skilled warriors um they were very speedy and uh due to the terrain they lived in which was very mountainous they could hide in places that you wouldn't think uh, such as trees um small um crevices and use their uh, size to their advantage and knowledge of the land um their women were known for their hair braiding skills and artwork you can see in this picture right here um this is women protesting for land and equal rights even though they're the indigenous people of the philippines they're ostracized in local and state government uh similar to the uh, black people in mexico that we talked about uh prior so again these uh black women are all indigenous to the philippines and just see your different types of hairstyles you see afros uh, you see braids you see wraps and again everyone's in red to symbolize you know uh the revolution they're all the same blood and they're fighting uh, for their rights to be recognized uh, by the filipino government um the women they also led uh, hunting raids back in the um i guess uh uh older times where they would take dogs and hunt uh, one of the main things they would like to hunt is a uh, wild boar and um actually the hunts were successful when uh, women led them or there was a combination of women and men uh, the women were the better hunters um, in the philippines um, this next picture right here you'll see uh, i eat a man uh, he's in a uh, traditional african garb for a ceremony again this is on the island of luzon in the philippines and by looking at his garb you probably would think he's in south africa because it looks very similar to the zulu culture and the traditional items that they wear again this people they recognize where they come from and they hold festivals every year um to um let that fact be known and also hold on to their cultural heritage uh which they strive to keep uh through all these years 
Um, later on, we'll talk about it, but their land is dissipating due to deforestation and um, a movement within the Philippines of more people from Europe and other places throughout the globe moving there, um, along with not being fully recognized by the government, they're being kind of pushed out. So uh, we want to look at that. Um, these people originally came to the Philippines as well as throughout the world as medical healers. Um, the Negrito people um, or pygmies were known for their knowledge of plants, for being out in nature. Um, again, they use herbs and different soaps to bathe in. When at this time in the world, bathing was thought that you would get a cold and die if you bathed every day. So people would bathe once every two weeks, once a month, et cetera. But the Negrito people uh, bathed every day. Um, they also had a lot of different traits that they uh, practice, again, due to their uh, spiritual system, um, which was animalism, which is a different form of voodooing where you uh, stayed in touch with the nature and its surroundings and were a one with it and can use it to help you and guide you throughout your path. Um, so that's a different uh, element that they brought to the Philippines uh, from uh, Africa. Um, as previously stated, their numbers are dwindling due to deforestation, European numbers increasing on the island and the local and national government. Um, as you can see in this picture right here, um, just like uh, black people throughout the globe, the Aita people have a love for the sport of basketball. Um, this is a picture on the island of uh, Luzon in the Philippines. Now, if we looked at this picture right here, it can look like any uh, black urban uh, location in America. Uh, you see jerseys. The man in the middle, his jersey actually says, I ate the tribe. And um, it's just a group of black people chilling in the corner. Um, you can't even tell which one is from America. So again, that shows you the African presence within the Philippines. You know what's interesting with that picture to me is that I don't know that I would necessarily tell you that I think they look American. Because what's weird is people to me tend to look American and not American. <laughs> I mean, even within black people, you can generally tell if someone is African American versus African. When I look at that picture, do you know what that looks like more to me? Like somebody, Cuba, Dominican Republic. The, I was gonna say somebody from the West Indies mm. or like Central or South America, that's their look. But then when you look at the background, when you put that picture back, those are the kind of places that you see there. Like that doesn't look like an American place whatsoever, yeah. but just the way that they look because of their racial and ethnic mixing, it looks way more like the West Indies to me or Central or South America. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And then you got to remember that mixing in the West Indies all came from Spain, uh, Portugal, the whole, yes. Spain, and then the slaves that they dropped off along with the indigenous uh, people that were already on the island. So they mixed together and became, you know, kind of one people with a heavy African element. So yeah, and, you know, like and what's interesting is if you if you were to do a, a like a quiz question, most people would get this wrong. Mm -hmm. Most people make the assumption that Brazil is Spanish and it's not. It's Portugal. Portuguese. Um, they speak Portuguese, but for because a majority of the West Indies has a very strong Spanish influence. I mean, you get the Dutch, you get the French, but the Spanish were definitely had way more investment through South Central America and the West Indies. But mm -hmm. Brazil is Portuguese. Again, that's the word that where it lies at. The church split the world in half, and Spain was given this part of the country. So you'll see Spain in the West and Portugal from Brazil to Africa. And you know, and it's interesting because when you look at Africa as a continent, you know, we, we tend to always want to see it as a country. You know, it's a continent. Yeah. Wait, what is it? More than fifty countries? Is there fifty three? Oh, fifty five now. Fifty five. Okay. And it's and it's interesting because it got carved up by colonialism. So obviously the French had a strong input. Um, the, that's the one place that the Spaniards didn't have. Isn't that interesting? No, oh, that's the do have. There's one African country that speaks Spanish. No, I said, but. It, from an influence standpoint, yeah. Spain was very big in the New World. Mm -hmm. um, and then you look at what you have within the Philippines. But the Spaniards were huge in the New World, if you think about it. Exactly. Exactly. Um, the French did a, a little bit more. But it's mm -hmm. odd for as much colonialism as you had in Africa, mm -hmm. the Spaniards weren't big in that. Neither were the Italians. Because mm -hmm. it was all about... The, the, you know, the papal house pretty much funding yeah. these expeditions. Mm -hmm. So I always think it's interesting that you didn't have more Spanish speaking countries mm -hmm. in Africa. 
Yeah, and you got to remember um, a lot of it was based off of economics too. So once you're given a certain territory, that's like your paper route. So you're going to be the only one on that route. So you'll reap all the benefits, whether it's economic or culturally. Um, in this case, a lot of times, um, a lot of these people in West Africa speak three languages. Mm -hmm. They still have their uh, colonizer language. Um, they kept their native tongue and the uh, monetary tongue of English. So um, there may be some Portuguese there, but it's not kind of shown. Right. Again, when you look at Lagos, Nigeria, Lagos, yes, a Portuguese name, but a lot of people don't realize that. I think what's what's also interesting about you look at how colonialism shapes so many things. With Africa being, if I know that if you look at a global map, often Africa is not truly represented by its landmass size. Exactly. It is it is pretty much the largest continent. It's massive. Yeah, you can the United States like three, three, like three times. Like three times. It's massive. The continental United States. And I think, I think people don't realize that massiveness. And what I think so influenced the fact that even though Africa was colonized, it could have been easier said than done if they just could have come through North Africa and they probably would have just absolutely consumed the country. But because of obviously, um, you know, Christianity having its whole, not being able to push through Islam, which was North Africa, um, they sailed around what they could get to. What mm -hmm. I think is interesting when you talk about how they even got to the Philippines, because it was like sailing around Africa to get to, if you think about it, because the English pretty much pretty yeah. much went past most of Africa to get to South Africa, because well, if you think about it from a landmass, Africa is mm -hmm. not an easy continent to conquer yeah. because of jungle and desert. Yeah. It's, ve it's very complicated to do that. And then one reason people don't realize that a lot of people sailed around, when you look at Rome, they had a lot of success in East Africa. But when you look at West Africa, mm -hmm. Rome lost to Hannibal in the Punic Wars. Yes. They, they were never able to get a presence there. So there's so much, it's so interesting that you think about that whole influence, like dropping into the Philippines, it was because they, they kind of went, because they had that whole naval presence. So mm -hmm. if you had a strong Navy set up, then you had the ability to travel. And the Spaniards, eventually they got, a good, a really good staple in their, in their, in their Navy. And hence you see way more of that in the new world, which was probably pure luck more than anything else. If you want to know the truth, because <laughs> they didn't know what was really there initially. So it's interesting, but it still was a big part of the slave trade. So it still stands to speak that the slave trade started in Africa. We know the triangle goes mm -hmm. to South America and then comes back up through the West Indies to the U S exactly. so it's still interesting that Spain, still in the English. It's so it's a very interesting mix when you mm -hmm. think about it historically. Mm -hmm. When you look at these things historically, uh, the best way to describe it is just think of a neighborhood that uh, one group of people uh, left and went there originally mm -hmm. 100 years later. Some of them came back through through colonization and then everyone mixed together. And then you see these uh, um, eclectic mixes like you see in the Dominican and different places where they have dark skin but the hair may not fit their perceived skin color. Even when you go to New York, you can talk to a person mm -hmm. or speaking Spanish and they can be, you know, as, as, as dark as a, a, a television or dark as night per se. And, you know, something you said in this particular episode that you mentioned when you talked about the um, background of Africans in hockey, mm -hmm. it was interesting how the sport was a way to create discipline and to get people involved specifically in church. Exactly. Okay, I'm gonna yeah. check out. It's almost time for you to wrap up and go to break. All right. Well, again, thank you so much. Uh, Maya made some good points. So um, when you look at today, that is a still a staple of church. Now it's just in Catholic uh, basketball a lot of times um, where basketball is still used to get uh, minorities um, to go to church. Um, so let's take a quick break on our on our way back, we'll give you um, some information on the uh, Philippine Basketball Association. I hope you're enjoying our new graphics this year with Sports Zone Chicago, the Motown of Sports Talk Radio. Uh, we'll be right back, and please stay with us. See me. See me. See me. See my dark skin and my kinky hair. See me. Don't see past me. Don't see through me. See me. See my tan skin and my curly hair. See me. Don't see past me. 
don't see through me. See me. See my face wet with tears from years of oppression. See my hands weathered and worn from decades of pulling myself up through your society. See my feet split from centuries of walking your delicate line. See me. See me. See me. I'm tired. I'm tired. I'm tired. Welcome back. Again, I am Jamar Hart, and this is Sports 101, the sports show that discusses the sport beyond the X and the goals. Again, we talk about the game from a people, places, and things perspective, looking at sport through the lens of history, past, present, and in the making through a critical and cultural lens. Again, make sure you get social with my show and a litany of other shows on Sports Zone Chicago, the Motown of Sports Talk Radio. Please follow us on Twitter at SportsZone CHI, Facebook at SportsZone Chicago, and Instagram at SportsZone Chicago. Subscribe to the YouTube channel, but most importantly, download the SportsZone Chicago app. The app can be found on the iTunes, Google Play, and Amazon stores. Now, let's talk about the Filipino Basketball Association. Men's Professional Basketball League uh, or men's professional basketball in the Philippines is composed of a 12 company branded franchise system. So each company has uh, a team and instead of having a home arena, what they do is they travel throughout the islands and market um, the companies. So there's a lot of national arenas built within the Philippines. Um, if you don't know in Asia and particularly Southeast Asia, fan involvement is very heavy. So the fans are synchronized things with uh, cards, um, different colors. Um, the wave in Southeast Asia is amazing. If you um, ever watch the baseball game on TV or anything like that. Um, so they do this not only um, to let fans get to see, but again, to market their products. Um, the league was founded in 1975 and is the first professional basketball league in Asia and is the second oldest basketball league in the world behind the, uh, the, the NBA. Um, the league's rules are a hybrid of rules from the NBA and FIBA. Remember, FIBA is the governing body of world basketball, and their rules are slightly different than the NBA with uh, reduced lane. Um, there's a, a larger uh, three-point area. Uh, shooting is emphasized over uh, strength and uh, power dunking uh, in the lane. Um, there's also different rules in regards when the ball is by the rim, how it can be touched. 
and uh, and files. Um, originally, uh, nine teams um, left the Manila Industrial and Commercial Athletic Association. So this athletic association was a group of businesses that got together and they um, were controlled by the Basketball Association of the Philippines. So it was sort of like boxing in the United States before it got regulated and um, it was kind of semi-pro. So they would take the workers uh, from the um, the athletic organization which compromised or comprised of all the uh, businesses and then they would field a team and then they would play, you know, sometimes on the weekend or weekdays and get a little bit of money of it. But um, they realized that it can make it, you know, bigger and they wanted to get FIBA recognized so they can play internationally. Um, so that's when the, um, one of the major concepts of starting the Filipino Basketball Association. Um, again, um, there's a lot of cultural pride within the Philippines and um, they wanted to be represented in the Olympics and just prove themselves on a, on a national stage. So in uh, January of 1975, um, um, there was a lot of team owners that came together to form this league. So you had uh, some owners from Toyota. Um, so they formed a team called the Toyota Comets, um, the Seven Up Uncolas, because the commercials uh, said Seven Up is the Uncola. So they used the team names unlike America, where it can be like the Steelers because, um, you know, that's indicative to the steel being made in Pittsburgh. Um, it could be named after a slogan or a catchphrase from an American commercial. So the seven up Uncolas, because seven up was an Uncola, um, the, the Toyota Comets, because you know, um, they believe a Toyota is a great car. The Presto um, Ice Cream was another team that formed and the carrier weather makers. Um, also, Emerson uh, Products had a team as well. Um, in 1989, uh, FIBA, which is the international body of basketball, they changed the rules and they allowed professional players uh, to play uh, in FIBA tournaments. Obviously, the United States didn't participate in this until the uh, 1990s with the Dream Team, but they were a few years behind everyone else in the world. Um, Another thing that's different about the Filipino Basketball League, there's not a season and a playoff and a champion. Remember, it's ran by businesses, so each business wants to be a champion of something. So what they do is they just play tournaments throughout the whole year and uh, challenge cups, uh, similar to soccer in Europe where you can have the um, Premier League season but still win the Carver Hall Cup or um, the FA Cup, you know, et cetera. Um, so they have different tournaments, and each team can win a different tournament. The main tournament or their main goal to win is the Filipino Cup, and that's the biggest tournament right there. That's the trophy for right. Like, that's the trophy for the Filipino tournament. And since it is the fit biggest tournament, they have specific rules in regards to that. Um, again, we uh, they do uh, coincide with FIBA rules, with a three-point line in the box, but there's also certain rules added to Filipino basketball um, for um, based off its demographic and uh, its national sovereignty, similar to in Japan. So um, if you're a non-Filipino player, you only can play in certain tournaments. So sometimes in a Filipino tournament, you may not be allowed to play um, if you're not a Filipino native, and that can either be you were born there or you got citizenship and became a naturalized citizen, which is what some uh, professional basketball players do. And coaches, I uh, will highlight a coach um, later who has about, about 15 years of coaching experience in the Philippines, 10 years of playing experience, if not more. Um, we all, go ahead, Maya. Um, yeah, is that kind of similar to with the Euro Basketball League? There can, like, for instance, only be so many non- say it's Poland or whatever that is a Polish team. So they can only have maybe one or two Americans or people outside the country and the team, even though they just run tournaments. It seems like they're still trying to keep the teams predominantly Filipino by limiting what outside players could come in and do. Yep. There's, there's, there's a limit on outside players and there's a limit on the height of outside players. Because again, most people in the Philippines are very short. So um, getting back to what Maya just said, a great segue um, one thing about these uh, 
uh, Filipino basketball teams is if you're a non-Filipino, you only can play in some tournaments if you're six five or less. And if you're a non-resident, you can be six foot or less and play in some tournaments. So basically, you're allowed one player on a team between six five and six ten, but he only can play in certain tournaments or certain games uh, due to the national sanctity of the game. Um, right now, um, there's a lot of teams that change names when businesses buy them. So if you looked at the uh, Filipino Basketball League right now, you'll see teams called the Pepsi Mega Bottlers. Again, that name is taken off uh, playoff. Pepsi is supposed to be the best. PepsiCo is the, the biggest drink company in the world. Uh, they actually battle with Coca-Cola Corporation. So the team name is the Pepsi Mega Bottlers. Um, that team used to be called the Mobiline uh, Cellulars um, off of a mobile company. And now it's called the TNT Tropane Giga. Uh, TNT stands for Talk and Text. That's a phone company in the Philippines. So this just shows you how things change. The uniforms change uh, from year to year. And again, it's just based off the business. Um, this is one reason when you look at leagues in Europe, Sometimes the players will say we didn't get paid because if the business owner had a bad month, you know, that month, none of his employees would get paid, um, either the basketball players or the people that work in the factory. Um, getting back to uh, the Americans that made a significant impact in Filipino basketball, uh, we can talk about Norman Black. Uh, Norman Black was one of the greatest coaches ever in the Filipino Basketball Association. Uh, Norman, he played at St. John's, and he was cut by the Detroit Pistons in the early 80s. Obviously, that was the bad boy era, and uh, it was very tough to make the team with Joe Dumars, uh, Isaiah Thomas, Vinnie Johnson, and others at guard. Uh, so he got a phone call to go to uh, Manila and play for a team in the Philippines. Um, he didn't know anything about it, but when he got over there, he recognized the culture and the love they have for basketball. Again, there's multiple leagues in the Philippines. You have the Philippine Basketball Association, which most likely uh, resembles the NBA. Um, then you have other leagues that um, are kind of semi-pro. Manny Pacquiao um, just bought a league that has uh, teams. And then um, there are even some leagues that play on nine-foot rims and smaller courts where you see like five, six, and five, seven guys dunking and throwing each other alley hoops. So if you're interested in that, uh, you can Google that on YouTube uh, for some entertainment. It's really good basketball being played, and it's just, you know, by short people in some of these leagues. Um, so while Norman Black, um, during his tour um, in the Filipino Basketball Association, he has won 11 uh, titles, and that's most likely 11 Filipino Cups because, again, there's no set championship because – Every week there's a championship because each business wants to have a trophy. It helps with their marketing. Um, he's been over there for over 40 years, and um, he's won a championship in each decade in the past 40 years. Um, he was asked by ESPN to name his all some of his all-time players in the Filipino Basketball Association. Some of these players have Afro origins. And it's kind of funny to see them being labeled as Filipino. But again, when you look at what countries are doing around the globe to promote nationalism, people are granting citizenship to people who have loose ties to the country to gain notoriety through sport. Um, so let's look at some of these top uh, Filipino Basketball Association players. The first one I want to go over is Jason Blur Castro. Again, um, as Maya pointed out before, a lot of these people will have Spanish uh, last names, um, Jason Castro, or the Blur as they call him. Uh, he plays for Talking Text right now. Uh, he also plays for the Filipino Olympic team. Um, he was a top point guard in Asia for some time, and uh, he gained notoriety for his speed and ball handling. Um, he did a lot of good things in the Asian Games or the Asian Cup, but unfortunately, um, at the time when he was playing uh, for the national team, um, they were still kind of growing within the sport. And you had mega countries such as the United States, uh, Spain, and s some of the European countries, uh, you know, hold dominance. Uh, now we want to look at uh, Sam Boy, Skywalker, and Lynn. 
is the next player we want to look at. Uh, Sam Boy is indigenous to uh, the Philippines. His nickname was Skywalker, not because he uh, dunked a lot, but because he would uh, jump and take daring drives uh, at the basket. Um, he was one of the top players in the 90s. Um, that was a Sam Boy Skywalker Lynn. His first name is Sam Boy. Again, in the Philippines, uh, some people that are indigenous have different names similar to Native American names in the United States. Um, now let's go to the American players that form a strong uh, presence. Um, the first uh, player we would like to talk about, um, the picture you just saw, is Andre Blatch. A lot of people may know Andre Blatch from his time in the NBA. Um, he became a natural, uh, he used to play for the Washington uh, Bullets, I believe, at the time, or it could have been the Wizards. Um, he became a naturalized Filipino so he could play for their national team. Again, um, there's a practice uh, when players get cut from the NBA. Oftentimes, they go to different countries. Uh, if you look at Stefan Marbury and what he did in China, he's a national icon. He has statues in China. Uh, he took his shoe over there and became uh, almost a billionaire. I remember uh, if I have a shoe that costs $20 and I sell it in the country of a billion people and I'm a national icon in that country, you know, I'm going to become a billionaire on top of what I did in the United States. Um, so due to his time spent in China uh, and what he did on the basketball court and the titles he won in China, he became a national celebrity. And the same thing happened, uh, you know, here. Um, another individual I would like to highlight is Jordan Clarkson. Uh, Jordan Clarkson, he didn't play in the Philippines. He played in the uh, NBA. You can see him here with the um, – Cleveland Cavaliers, but he's one of the players with a loose Filipino origin. So his his both his parents were born and raised in the United States. His dad is black, but his mom's parents are from the Philippines, and his mom is half Filipino. So being a fourth Filipino, and uh, I think he traveled there once before because uh, he had grandparents and aunts and uncles over there. He had a Filipino um, passport. Um, he was able to play for the Philippines in 2008 in the um, Asian qualifiers in 2018, excuse me. Um, just like they have uh, in soccer, they have CONCACAF, which is the Caribbean and, and North American Confederation of uh, Football. Um, in CONCACAF, they have um, the Asian qualifiers. So the Philippines have to pay uh, Asian powers such as China uh, and Korea which again, uh, China has billions of people and Korea has a, a population almost double the size of the Philippines as well too. So they're up against a staunch competition. So uh, Jordan Clarkson, um, you know, being a, uh, they made him a citizen of the Philippines. And in 2018, he played for the Philippine uh, national team. Uh, again, similar to in the United States and track and other sports, if you don't make the United States team, uh, most people go play for a team in the African diaspora, which is the West Indies, um, uh, Haiti, uh, Jamaica, uh, and some of the other islands. Um, he's one of the first ones to go all the way to uh, the Philippines and play based off a, a loose uh, family tie. Um, now we want to talk about um, Kai Soto right here. Kai Soto is an up-and-coming uh, Filipino um, if you can see um, this picture of Kai Soto, this is him playing basketball in the Philippines. Now, when you look at Kai Soto, remember we talked about there's a lot of different racial groups and cultures within the Philippines, so everyone is not short. So a lot of these teams in the Filipino Basketball Association um, do have taller players, um, but they're, uh, you know, nationalized uh, or um, natural citizens, excuse me, of the Philippines. So he is the um, next up and coming hope. He um, it is his goal to be the first player born and raised in the Philippines to play in the NBA. Um, right now, he is uh, 18 years old and he is seven foot two inches tall. Um, there is a lot of tall people, or there is a tall element in the Philippines due to the close proximity in China. A lot of people in China um, are short too, but there's certain. Uh, tribes or cultural groups within China that are very uh, tall and particularly um, the province where Yao Ming is from. 
Um, so um, there is a background for height within the Philippines. And November of 2019, he announced that he would leave uh, playing in the Philippines. This was a big move because similar to, again, Japanese baseball, they have to play a certain number of years within the Philippines to uh, promote that league and not water it down. But due to um, his notoriety and wanting to be the first player in the NBA, they allowed him to leave at a young age. And he joined the Skill Factory uh, in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, it's a prep uh, program that will help you uh, with your ball handling skills. And he got training in culture and language as well. Um, when he got there, um, he, he played one day later. And this is his second day in the United States. Um, he had 18 points and 12 rebounds and a 65-61 loss to IMG Academy. So if you don't know about IMG Academy, IMG Academy is a team that cherry picks the best players throughout the United States. And um, it's a high school team as well as a prep team. So he played IMG High School and lost by four points in his second day of the United States and had 18 points and 12 rebounds. Um, he made his national de team debut for the Philippines in 2017 at a SEBA tournament. So that's the Southeast Asia Basketball Association, SEBA. So they had an under-16 championship in uh, Quezon City in the Philippines. Uh, um, he's represented the Philippines at the 2019 FIBA Under-19 World Cup in Greece, where his team finished 14th. There, he averaged 11 points and seven rebounds, uh, and he tied uh, with an African player uh, with a, a tournament high average three blocks per game. Um, thank you for so much, and I would like to leave you for some final thoughts just on all this information uh, that you soaked in. Remember, if you forget anything, just go log on uh, to Sports Zone Chicago through the app. Remember, we are the Motown of Sports Talk Radio. Um, so in all this, I just want to leave you with a few quick tenets. Um, what I've learned through this research is basketball is a game that can bridge gaps between cultures and it can be used as a tool of enticement. Um, as Maya uh, said earlier, it was used in several places to get people to come and sit down and learn about uh, Christianity and get them to ultimately leave their cultural names, uh, spiritual systems, and way of life and convert uh, to the colonizers religion. Um, now it's being used as a tool to promote nationalism, um, not only in the Philippines, but throughout the world. Uh, so many people are taking people from the diaspora, particularly the United States, and adding them to their countries for athletic prowess um, on an international stage. Um, this is very similar because the Philippines and countries like this are kind of niche countries and a market with a lot of large countries. So when you compare these smaller countries, let's look at um, what's going on in collegiate football right now. There's a shift going on, and particularly in black college football, with the um, increase in transfers as well as the hiring of Deion Sanders at Jackson State University and what he's doing on a recruiting path. So similar to Dion uh, getting players that were originally supposed to go to Georgia with the Philippines and a lot of these other countries are getting are getting athletes that were in the United States, but are now coming to them not only to be athletes, but experience a different way of life. Because once they get done again, invoking the references of Stefan Marbury, they become nationalized uh, figures and uh, celebrities in these countries. So again, um, the, uh, the WNBA is also a model of this because it's a niche and specific league. Um, in closing, thank you for tuning in to Sports 101. Again, I'm Jamar Hart. Be sure to follow me on Twitter at Coach underscore Hart 412. Please get social with Sports 101, uh, Sports uh, Sean and Maya in the morning, The Smoke Fellas, What's Up Cuz, Super Producer Ivan, and all uh, 15 of his shows, uh, with Sports Zone Chicago. You can follow us on Twitter at Sports Zone CHI, Facebook at Sports Zone Chicago, and Instagram at Sports Zone Chicago.
don't forget subscribe to the youtube channel search sports zone chicago but most importantly please download the app remember sports zone chicago is the only black owner operated sports talk app of its kind in the world we are the motown of sports talk radio and podcast you can find sports zone chicago on the itunes google play and amazon stores Again, thank you for coming out. I hope you enjoyed our new setup and our graphics as we try to improve and increase your involvement with Sports on Chicago in 2021. I will see you next week. Thank you, and have a great and productive weekend. You see me, you hear me, respect me. Respect, due regard for the feelings, wishes, rights, or traditions of others. We don't have to agree, but I deserve to be heard. I stand my ground, respect me. We don't have to be friends, but I deserve your civility. I stand my ground. Respect me. You don't have to understand my culture, but I deserve to be authentically myself. I stand my ground. Respect me. I stand in defiance of your need to make me less in order for you to feel adequate. I stand. I stand aware that the America that you see and love today is a result of my free labor. I stand. I stand knowing that the contempt you have for me was not instigated by me, but perpetuated by the fear you have of me. I stand. I stand surviving your many attempts to emasculate me. Indeed, I thrive despite it. I stand realizing that you take many things from me, but I will not allow you to take my respect. I am a man. I am a proud man. I am a proud black man. I am authentically, undisputedly, unapologetically a proud black man. I am authentically, undisputedly, unapologetically a proud Black man. I am authentically, undisputably, unapologetically a proud black man. Respect me. I have done more than enough to deserve it. And still you would hold it. The bill is past due. You owe me. Respect me. Respect me. Respect me.